in the realm energy. Um, this is the, the one we are going to look at. And after that, we do some practice uh, in uh, trying to trying to um, relate compassion to the wider program of society. And this one is from California, Jana. Reimagining compassion as power. It has uh, three, three examples from here. One in a restaurant, one in a social center. Okay. In Washington, D.C., they're celebrating a restaurant one of them had just opened. It was about 10 p.m. There's a fellow there named Michael. He had his wife and daughter, and he was talking to his wife when he noticed a hand in the barrel of a gun coming to him. A man of medium build in a clean sweatshirt stepped up and pointed the gun at his daughter, and then pointed the gun at his wife. And look Michael in the face and said, give me your money or I'm going to start a new shoot. And it was an odd coincidence that none of the party had any money. So they started casting around trying to figure out what they were going to do to dissuade this man. And the person that they came on was killed. What would your mother think of you? Didn't work. I haven't got any of them. So now it's tense. And Michael's looking around and he's saying, Someone's going to get hurt, maybe you At which point, a woman named Christina stepped up and tried to have an attack. Hey, we're all celebrating, she said. Why don't you sit down and share a glass of wine? <clears throat> Michael said it was like a switch foot. You could feel it. The man took the glass of wine. Damn, that's a good glass of wine. Michael offered him the bottle. He put his gun in his pocket, reached for some cheese. He said, hey, can I have a hug? Christina hugged him, and Mike's wife hugged him. How about a group hug? They all hugged him around him, gave him a hug, and when they let him go, he said, I'm sorry. And walked out with his glass of wine. So what happened there? Michael says he knows what happens. It was a miracle. And you can see why he would think that. But I want to propose something different happened. I want to propose that was compassion done powerfully. And by compassion, I don't mean the casual phrases that we throw off. I don't mean I feel terrible for you, I can't imagine how you feel, or I know just how you feel. I don't mean that. I mean finding and meeting fundamental needs. And by fundamental human needs, I don't mean a glass of wine, a chunk of cheese, and a stack of cash. I mean those universal things that we feel we've got to have to survive and strive for things. So I mean sure safety and security, but also affection, connection, being seen and heard, belonging. So we don't know what the government needed that night. We may never do. Whatever it was, Christina may have stumbled on it by accident or by instinct, but he wanted it more than money. And it was strong enough to deflect a bullet and maybe save a life and maybe more. So the question to us becomes, wouldn't it be great if we can marshal that and create those results in critical situations and it wasn't a miracle? Wouldn't it be great if we were in debt and handling human interactions so that we could keep conflict from escalating or so that we could sidestep it all together. And in my experience, we can. And what that takes is reimagining compassion. Not as kind of simple warmth or kindness, but instead a set of concrete practices that you can use when you don't want to get into a test of wills that you can use when you're afraid that force will fail or escalate or backfire. Pretty simple set of practices. So, listen for a call for help, share empathy, and share options. 
How would that look? Well, here's an example when it comes to work that I've done in healthcare. It comes up pretty often. How do you cope with a patient or a family member who's really upset? This comes from work that I did in a youth mental health clinic in a really, really difficult part of the town. So there's a woman in the lobby, and she's a patient's mother, and she's screaming and yelling and stomping. She's yelling at her kids. You better get the hell over here. You better sit your butt down. You better listen to your mom. And she's yelling at the receptionist. You better get me in to see my damn guard. They send out a security guard. He says, ma'am, you can't talk that way. She ignores it. The lobby's a life. So put yourself in that situation. What are you going to do? If you're like most people, you're going to try to get her to calm down. And that's what David tried. He was the therapist who had to go out and deal with her. He said, ma'am, I need you to calm down. You're right. You're right. Didn't work. Fail by the So, what we want to get clear on this white fail. And the reason that it failed is that he was dealing in the level of actions, not at the level of the needs that we've been talking about. So, imagine a bullseye that has needs in its center and actions at the periphery. Here's the problem this woman comes in, and you can tell she's got some really deep seated needs, yes? So, she tries to come up with an action plan that will meet those needs. And when she comes up with one, she gets attached to it. Because if only, if only I can carry out these actions, I'll get these needs met. And so those actions stand in place of those needs. So when David walks up and says, you can't do those actions, he becomes an enemy that's coming between her and what she needs. And two things happen. He becomes an enemy, Someone standing between her and her needs, and she has needs. So she won't listen to him, and she has needs. So what's the alternative? The alternative is to go through that process that we talked about. Listen for a call for help. And that means thinking about that dynamic that we talked about before, and bypassing actions and going to needs. So looking at that woman and saying, she is not an opponent that I need to stop. She is a person with needs that she needs badly and she's afraid she's going to fail. And that flips the switch in me and I begin to get more out. Then I can exchange your with her. So essentially that means going to this person that I used to see as an opponent and saying, what do you need? And you can use emotions as a guide. So, if I'm getting my needs met, I'm some kind of happy. If I'm not getting my needs met, I'm some kind of suffering. I'm in pain or I'm angry. So, David steps up to this woman and says, You seem really upset. That's the emotion. Do you need attention? That's the need. She didn't thank me. Right? Because that's the point. She's been trying to get across for 30 minutes. But if he can keep that up, if he can keep up acknowledging her needs and acknowledging her feelings, she'll experience that as a switch will begin to flip in her, and she'll begin to open up. And what David found out when that happened was that there was a lot of fear behind this woman's anger. Her eldest son had just been thrown out of his third daycare for aggression, essentially for bullying. And she didn't see how she was going to get him care and put food on the table, so she was near tears. Now that David understands that, he's faced with a whole different problem than he thought he was. So now he can begin to share options with her. What looked at first like it was a demand for her to get in to see her doctor, now it shows up as something that can solve a whole variety of ways. We can call your daycare center and explain to them what's going on. We can get a referral to another agency. We can call your neighbors and see if we can enlist them. And there are other options. So there are a whole variety of options, and that's important because what we're driving with, with this form of compassion, is collaboration. It's not domination. It's not intimidation. It's not submission. And it's not compromise. This isn't yell quiet. This is a new set of options that didn't seem to be on the table before we could talk to each other. And that model that I just laid out 
for you. It works really well one on one, and it works across domains. So it works all throughout healthcare, but we've also discovered that it works with parents who want cooperation from their kids, or mothers who want a better experience of life with her mom, or an executive who's got a corporate initiative and is trying to get cooperation from another executive who doesn't know it. So it transfers across domains. But you might ask yourself, okay, good. It works with friends and family, it works with colleagues, it works with customers, that's nice. What about people who hate you? What about your enemies? And it's great that it works one on one, but we have systemic issues. What about systems? Does it work on a system wide basis? And Connie Rice might have been asking herself those kinds of questions a few years ago. Connie Rice is a civil rights attorney and activist in LA. And her lawsuits have brought in better than $10 billion in damages as she's tried to protect and fight for communities like the Watts neighborhood in LA. You may be familiar with the Watts neighborhood. It's got a tough history. That's a place that people describe as a cross between a tenement and a dilapidated army barracks. In 1965, you might remember the riots, ended up in 34 deaths and $40 million in property damage. And when you're talking about property damage as a result of riots in your neighborhood, you're talking about rocks and bullets and broken glass and fire. Riots again following Rodney King's arrest in 1991, this time 55 deaths and a billion dollars in damages. That's a tough neighborhood. In the 80s and 90s, there were so many homicides in this neighborhood that parents took to having their kids sleep in the bathtub. And the police responded with paramilitary campaigns. You may remember cops and riot Campaigns that went by names such as Crash or Operation Hammer. And it was re as a result of those campaigns and the Rodney King incident, Connie Rice went to war. In her words, went to war with the LA Police Department and began to launch lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit and was successful until she stopped. And you might wonder why she stopped after 20 years. And the reason was, she looked at that neighborhood and said, this will never be enough. These lawsuits will never end. You cannot legislate behavior change. This community I'm trying to protect is segregating and, in her words, turning into a killing zone. So what do you do? She said, this problem will be solved with empathy and compassion. Over the course of 18 months, she interviewed 900 police officers. Think of what an act of courage that is. To go into the heart of a group that you've been fighting for 20 years and ask what do you need. And what she heard was fear beneath the towel, time and time again. Ms. Rice, I'm terrified of black men. Ms. Rice, you know those black men, they come out of prison, they have that great hope strength. I'm afraid they're going to kill me. Can you teach me how not to be afraid of black men? How tough is that to hear from a group of people who have pulled over your neighbors, pulled them out of their cars, thrown them on the ground, and search them with no provocation. And her response to that was not labeling them, but saying, to me and my community, that sounds like racism. To you, it doesn't. It's a true expression of fear. And any solution that, we get, that we're going to come up with that's going to work has got to work for my community, and it's got to work for you as well. So we need to work together. There's a model of courage. So they came up with a new model of policing. They brought together the community, civil rights advocates, the police force, and they came up with a four-pronged
armed model police, police hanging out in the neighborhoods, tutoring kids, setting up sports teams, and even setting up health screens. And you gotta ask yourself, come on, this is a this is a game-torn neighborhood. This is a, a neighborhood with a paramilitary presence in it. And you're gonna form study groups and health screens. How did that work? In Nickerson Gardens, where it was piloted, 66% drop in property crime. 90% drop in physical crime. That means people getting hurt. The Bucks neighborhood is still torn by struggle between police and the residents, but overall, 70% drop in homes. In very fact, it's held up as a model around the country. And that model that we talk about, that model of interacting, of showing compassion and empathy, works system-wide in other areas as well. It works when, for example, you're trying to reduce recidivism among prison inmates, and it's been shown to be effective at fighting bullying in school districts where zero tolerance policies fail. So in general, What's the takeaway? Compassion is power. Compassion is not what you fall back on when force fails. Compassion, if done deliberately, can turn enemies into allies. And when that happens, you're solving different problems that you started with. And you're facing solutions that weren't on the table and weren't in your imagination when you started. Compassion is so what does that mean to you? I don't know what part of the world you're trying to change, or what change you may feel being thrust upon you right now. But wouldn't it be great to be powerful? Wouldn't it be great if you could create results like that at critical times and it wasn't a miracle? And you can. You can win and other people don't have to lose. You can create change and you don't have to force it. And the process can be healing. So how do you start? Next time you're toe to toe with somebody, whether that's face to face or whether that's over Twitter or over Facebook or whatever social media you have, next time you're face to face with someone who opposes you, who threatens you, who annoys you, who angers you, who you see as an enemy, consider that the four most powerful words that you can use may not be this one on stand. It might be with me. So this is uh, about system, how compassion can work. In system-wise basis, um, <clears throat> I think it's not enough to to just um, you know have have compassion for ourselves, and of course compassion for ourselves, which is self-compassion and compassion for others. Uh, these two things they cannot be separated. If we are not compassionate towards others, um, the people you know we work with, the people we interact with, uh, if they are not uh, at peace, you know, uh, compassionate, mind cannot be sustained. <clears throat> Today, I have been you know, trying to tell you that compassion is more than a warm feeling. It's more than, oh, I understand your feeling. It's more than that kind of... Um, expression. It's about being interested in problems. 
and thinking about the solution. Thinking about the solution. But to do that, before we do that, we need to be able to exchange empathy. So what we have been doing for the last maybe two years, three years since I have been going around and, and doing this, um, actually we have been doing this at the empathy level. And today I'd like to um, impress upon you that compassion is about action. It's about action. It's about being interested in problem and and using that, uh, using those problems as our motivation. When we do so, <clears throat> when we do so, um, we become ethical um, automatically. Ethics, in a sense that we think about other people. We. We recognize their desire uh, to be happy, to be at peace, uh, just like us. So with this recognition, uh, we are doing our job. We are not talking about uh, volunteering and, 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 and you know, making things you know, freely available to everyone. You know, we, we cannot do that. that. That would be beyond our means. No country can do that in the world. Even the richest country wouldn't be able to do that. It wouldn't be sustainable. Then compassion then, is, is about uh, creating or contributing or sustaining a program or um, creating an environment for such, sorry, a system or creating creating um, an environment for such a system, compassionate system to, to arise and to exist, to exist. <clears throat> In this country, we have about six or, six or seven councils, medical council, engineering council, nursing council, uh, that sort of thing. And all those councils, okay, when we talk to the international body, they always talk about ethics. I have been to the nursing council, I've been to the engineering council. Um, they say that uh, we still have a hard time convincing uh, our members, their members, about the importance of ethics. Um, we are used to doing things our own way. So when we want to be compatible with uh, international uh, operation, international um, standard, um, we do need to take into consideration the importance of ethics. Uh, in this country, we pay a lot, of, a lot of attention to ethics, but only at the individual level not so much at the system level, at the national level. And I think we all can play a role in this. <clears throat> um, when two companies are talking to each other, um, to think about each other, to think for each other, that's a win-win situation. That's um, um, not only you know, through our own conscience, not our own conscience, but if it can happen as a culture, if it can happen as, uh, as a t set of you know, rules and regulations uh, put in place, no, that would be, that would be good. That would be good. That would bring the whole country up. <clears throat> so, um, uh, so, for example, our engineering, engineering degrees, I mean, our professors are trying, so that are in, trying hard, so that our engineer, engineering degree are recognized by um, other countries. And, um, 
Uh, in order to do that, uh, there are certain ethical codes, ethical conduct that they have to follow. The same with medical uh, counsel. In many countries where ethical standard is high. Uh, you cannot be a practicing doctor and also selling medicine at the same time. Uh, they consider this as a conflict of interest. So this conflict of inter uh, interest um, has, has a lot to do with, with ethics. With ethics because, you know, I can actually um, maneuver, maneuver the, the people uh, if I am in both in both the camps. I'm I'm a practicing doctor at the same time. I'm I'm also you know uh, the owner of um, a pharmacy like this. So we need to pay attention to this kind of system. Um, uh, looking at the, 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 the problem from compassion point of view, the point of view of compassion, because it will be good for everyone. It will prevent a lot of problems. It will solve a lot of the existing problems. So in, the, in this uh, last uh, practice session, what I want to suggest that we do is that we we focus on uh, the problem of, of the system, the problem of the country, the problem of the establishment, the problem of the culture, if you like. I'm not talking about the government, I'm talking about the country as a whole. It doesn't matter which, whichever government comes to power, <coughs> is in power. Um, so. No, of course, you know, every country is, 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 is still trying to catch up with the uh, high ethical standard. I happen to be invited to be on the board of um, Buddhist and Hindu ethical um, committee for Taojun. <laughs> for Taojun. I have never been to Taojun. Um, but you know, I'm on the list, and in case there is an ethical issue, um, we get consulted. Um, I'm also on the ethical council of in England, ethical council for um, for NHS. Um, so, so, what do you do, okay, if somebody has to pull the plug out of? A patient removing life-sustaining machine. Um, that sort of thing that, that we have to offer advice. I think here in Myanmar we can all work together because we already have um, this um, foundation, foundation from Buddhist ethics, foundation from Buddhist philosophy. But we need to learn how to apply these uh, it's uh, ethical philosophy to um, to daily practice for people who are interested there is an online journey it's called the journey of buddhist ethics it's an online journey uh, difficult issues are discussed over there where research articles <clears throat> now Mm, the reason that I want to expand compassion practice into uh, into looking at system is um, because when we are faced with a system that doesn't work properly, we get annoyed, we get agitated, we become pessimistic, we become negative. And that would affect everyone. That would affect everyone. We would start blaming people. We would start criticizing people. <clears throat> by blaming people, by criticizing people, I, I feel that sometimes 
we become part of the problem and not part of the solution. Not part of the solution. So in order to become part of the solution, uh, we should start contributing positively, uh, not just offering um, critical comments and, and, and negative comments. So part of this is to familiarize ourselves with the problem that we face in the country, in the country, and to um, develop motivation to to change them in the way that uh, that, that that would work for um, both the strong and the weak, the privileged and the underprivileged. Um, the powerful and and the, the less powerful, the ruler and the the, the rude. <clears throat> so, um, in this particular meditation, uh, compassion meditation practice, first we are going to start uh, with individual, uh, that is, with ourselves and then with our family members, so we will still start with this. We still use uh, this uh, compassion as the basis. And then we will look at, say, you are all in, involved in some sort of, um, uh, in, some, in, in some sort of business, in, in organization, um, like that. So you can think about you don't really have to tell me, but you can think about the kind of hurdle you come across because of the system. And when you think about that, look at your own emotional reaction. If there is negative emotion, you need to work on this first before you can change the system. Before you can change the system, you have to change yourself first. If I'm negative about the system, forget about changing it. I will make it worse. I make it worse. That is why in this particular instant, the Buddha says, we have to take care of our emotion first. It's like if I'm, I'm stuck in the mud, I wouldn't be able to help anyone. So if we get really annoyed and, and agitated and and I was angry with the system. Whatever we try to do, we be out of uh, aggression, perhaps. So we need to um, pay attention to anger management. Um, you may be familiar with Marshall Rosenberg's. Um, Nonviolence communication method. Nonviolent communication theory. This is in psychology. It's a big thing. It's a big thing. Uh, but I think Buddhist uh, vipassana meditation, insight meditation, and also karuna and mudita meditation have a lot to contribute to this. So we think about we think about the system that we face that we come across in our daily life in our work. And when you see limitation, you are at a crossroad. One is to get angry, that is to turn right, and the other is to turn left, that is to feel compassionate. Uh, about this and, and trying to change it. To feel compassionate um, about the problem, you need to feel affiliated to people, you need to feel people's pain in this. So by doing so, we move from self-centered to other center, from self-centered to other center from inward looking to outward looking. To outward looking. This is a big step, a big step. But this is something that 
that, that is going to make you very powerful. Powerful to the extent that you can change the system. Change the system. But that change has to take place in our own heart first. So think about a problem. In my case, I'm an, an educationist. I'm also a public speaker. So I would think about this thing. I would think about the kind of problem that I come across. Um, I'm involved in maybe about about 40, about 40 universities, visiting about 40 universities, um, engaging with some of them deeply, you know, like collaboration and trying to get things done like that. Um, I have come across a, a lot of limitation, a lot of fear on the part of the academics, the administrators. It's no use to go and blame them. It's no use. I need to feel that pain. I need to feel that limitation. And I need to help them to overcome this. Compassion should come with an action. So, in your case, you should be doing this as well. Otherwise, okay, I have been out of the country maybe about 32 years, 33 years. I have come across a lot of um, overseas, overseas, um, you know, Myanmar fellow um, citizens. I mean, when I say citizen, I'm not referring to that passport. I'm, I'm referring to their origin. Many of them uh, would talk down about the country. Whenever they see one uh, defect, one shortcoming, and they would feel agitated. And when they would be praising one particular country, uh, they cannot stop that. In the same breath, they would be talking down about this country. Um, I used to get agitated with them. Now I don't get agitated with them anymore. I feel their pain. And they get stuck in that emotional turmoil. And they need to help themselves first if they want to help any country. So I start uh, talking about the same thing overseas, okay, among the, the Burmese community overseas as well. That is, if you talk negative things about anyone, about any country, you are actually feeding um, the undesirable wolf in your, in your mind the bad wolf in your mind, not the good wolf. Okay, I don't want to use the word color because it's a little bit discriminatory. That is in, in the, the, the one they use in psychology. So let's say two wolves, one is undesirable wolf, negative wolf, the, the other is a desirable one, um, positive wolf. So anytime we think, we, we think about negative, uh, we, we entertain a negative thought, we are feeding this negative wolf in our mind. So when we need to make a decision, that negative wolf would come out and dictate our decision-making process. Even if you have the right facts, the right information, but if your emotion is the wrong emotion, negative emotion, negative emotion, then the fact that you have will be manipulated, will be misused to justify your negative emotion. So we can start here. We can start here. And by changing ourselves in relation to the system, changing our perception, changing our EQ, our emotional uh, quotient, we are in the next step, 
are ready to to be part of the positive change that we all want. <clears throat> so we are going to be meditating for about uh, 10 minutes again this time. Uh, this time you need to be mindful of two things. One thing is anger management. When you think about system, uh, is there a tendency to blame? Is there a tendency to put people down, to talk people down? Okay. Um, think about, I mean, so be, be careful of that. If you see, just observe it. Just observe it. In, uh, there's a lot of negative emotion flaring up in the UK during the Brexit. I hope it will be over soon. But the trauma, you know, will be there for quite some time. I would emphasize in my meditation session every Friday. So it doesn't matter which way you have voted. You have voted. You need to believe in the country. You need to believe in the, in the, in the people in the people. And what is important is that if you want to become part of the solution, you cannot entertain a lot of negative emotion. Um, blaming each other, you know, it, it's not possible. Not possible. So we're going to start meditation now for, for 10 minutes, maybe for about 20 minutes we have time. Just starting. Okay, breathing in and out, in and out, slow and gentle for about one minute, for about one minute, and then start thinking about practical problems in your um, working life. Any problem? When you think about them, then look at your emotional reaction. The goal is to develop compassion using those problems as motivation.
is ten minutes now. Any question we have? About uh, twenty minutes, fifteen, twenty minutes for question time. Anyone has any question? Has microphone? ตัวเวงโกเนี่ยสิเนี่ยอ่าพยาอัตตะมังกะพาลมีผีเนี่ยมาสะปิรอผีเนี่ยมาอกรุณาเนี่ยอกรุณาสะสะปิรอผีอก
she has written a book called Self Compassion. And uh, she and one other person has a chapter in this, in this self compassion. According to her, self compassion has three components. Three components. <clears throat> one is Kindness versus self criticism. When we make a mistake, um, we think the way to improve ourselves is to be critical of ourselves, to blame ourselves. Um, According to the philosophy of self-compassion, actually, that's the time we should be kind to ourselves. Instead of beating ourselves up, we should recognize, okay, this is a hard time. I need to give myself some, some kindness to go through this. Otherwise, we will develop some sort of trauma. And we develop fear, fear of failure. Actually, not every failure is, is a bad thing. Not every failure is, is, is bad. Some of the, the failures, you know, they actually bring more insight and wisdom to us. It's, um, uh, for the success to come, it's, it's important sometimes that we, we go through hard times that we, we fail. So, what is important though here is um, uh, instead of um, beating ourselves up, it's important to give ourselves some kindness, to remember to be kind to ourselves. How are you going to treat your friend if your best friend has made a mistake? You're not going to criticize that person. Instead, you're going to support. You're going to support that person emotionally. Such thing happen. Don't give up. It's okay. I'm sure you get through this. You need to say the same thing to yourself. Yeah. And the second thing is um, um, on humanity versus isolation. When we make a mistake, if we think that we are the only one making this a problem and everyone else is perfect. When you're meditating here, if your mind is wandering, if you start thinking that everyone else is very focused, very concentrated, I'm the only one wandering around. You're isolating yourself. You're isolating yourself from common experience. Everyone else has wandering mind. I do. I do. You know, in the latest meditation retreat, uh, in the Dengu, I was breathing very harsh. Very harsh. And, and the breathing was very smooth here for two hours. I was very surprised the mind still wanders. I was very surprised. And I still found, okay, some, some gaps um, to fall asleep. <laughs> breathing very harsh and you fall asleep. The breathing continue. <laughs> it's amazing. That technique, you need to learn. You need to go and learn over there. <laughs> I can't. I just can't pass it to you today. So, isolation 
versus common humanity. Common humanity is a wild. This kind of thing happened. It happened to everyone. Today it happened to me. You align yourself with other people's experiences. So this is self-compassion. Isolation is self-centered. This is universalization of our experience. To look at our experience in the context of universal, universality. By doing so, we enrich our own experience and we don't feel isolated. Last one is mindfulness versus uh, self-identification. When there's a mistake, mindfulness means just to recognize it and let it go, recognize it, let it go. Recognize it as a spectator, as a third person. The other one, the bad habit, the negative habit is to identify yourself with this failure and create an identity. You know people say, I'm a failure. When they say that, they identify themselves with that failure. Can someone be a failure all the time? No. You know, we have succeeded many times, but when we make a mistake once, we forget all our successes and we become obsessed with our failure, with our failures. If I make mistakes speaking in public once, if I do this, I will never speak again. You know, because I don't have self-compassion. So these are the components of um, self-compassion. In Burmese, this is Mitta, this is Dota. Mitta versus Dota. This is Anatta, this is Atta. This is the deep, this is Deity. Deity. There's no I in mistake, but you put I in the mistake. You are kind of register as, you know, copyright, and that mistake becomes yours. You identify with that. So it's difficult to overcome that when that happens. So it's important when, that we become uh, self-compassionate. But these self-compassionate attitudes, they cannot be separated from compassionate, from being compassionate for us. Anymore. Microphone. Yes, yes, yes. So, how would you relate the six senses into, into, into this? Would that be a function of uh, consciousness or uh, which uh, category would that be?
um, the way our, um, psychophysical body functions, uh, the mind, the body function is like this. The eyes and the visual object, they come together. When they come together, um, the, they trigger the mind, it's called consciousness. That consciousness arises. And that consciousness, it's just being aware of something. Okay, it hasn't come to the color, it hasn't come to the shapes and sizes. It hasn't come to the past memory. When I say this is flower, I already combine, it's more than consciousness, I already combine with my past memory. If I have never seen flowers before, I wouldn't know these flowers. Because I have seen this and I combine this with my memory, so-called perception. Flower is like this. It has its stem and, and uh, small branches and then flowers. I have that perception as flowers. So if you show me flowers, okay, not corresponding to this memory, I will have problem with my perception. But by the time I understand this is a flower, it's way past consciousness. Or it come into thinking and then understanding. We are just talking about the mind. Actually, the mind doesn't work on its own. It works with uh, its associates. In Abhidhamma, in Abhidhamma we say you know, the mind is called say and it associate they are called siddhate. And those siddhate, those associate, they are the element that um, that color the mind, that classify the mind, that, that uh, differentiate one mind from the other. So, um, if I think about something, I think about something and I get angry because um, I prefer a red color and, and this is white color. You see, you can see my prejudice. And because of that prejudice or perception, now the white color triggers anger or maybe past trauma. Past trauma. Uh, these are these are all happening here, happening here. So this is what we say in Buddhist psychology, thought process. So we analyze thought process in detail. Say that we teach it in detail. Any more questions? Anyone has any comment about the system, compassion on the system? One thing that I expect from you is that, okay, you observe and you can see your own reaction. If the reaction is downbeat, negative, you see that's something that you need to work on. <clears throat> Before you can change, other people, before you can change the system, that's where you need to work on. That would be my message today. If you no longer react negatively, then you know you're almost halfway um, into, <coughs> into um, you know, becoming part of the solution. Mm, 
I think so. I, I agree with you that there are c- certain pillars, you know, uh, you can talk about um, a certain um, uh, so systems, uh, maybe democracy and, and openness, whatever, uh, respect for each other. But I think those qualities, uh, they will come easily and, and will be sustained um, if members, many members of society you know, have this compassion. If they are aware of, I mean, if they extend their compassion uh, from individual domain to the system. Um, we may have a lot of good pillars okay, in place, um, but if we're not able to uh, develop um, in certain kind of they call social skill, in some kind of they, so they call EQ, uh, here I call compassion. So if we cannot develop this, um, we will abuse the system. Um, we can even, you know, um, uh, manipulate the system for our own sake. So I'm not talking about or using compassion to l- replace everything. I'm talking about using compassion to prepare, to enhance, and perhaps you know, uh, to explore uh, how to improve systems. There are people who try to improve uh, a system. I mean, you can look at the House of Commons in London. But there are people who have um, ulterior motive um, for their own party and not so much for the whole country. So when the other party comes, comes to power and, and they want to do, to do away with whatever the previous one has done. And if we look at the history of um, lawmaking, you know, we, we will see that people spend a lot of time um, just to, to do with, with whatever their opponents have put in place. We waste a lot of time and, and resources doing that. If those pillars are to come from people, and if those people have compassionate heart, then you know we can be more positive and hopeful. Because anyone uh, with some kind of power, you know, is, uh, wants to change the system. But to change the system for its own sake. Uh, wouldn't solve any problem. So, my belief is that uh, we should create an environment where compassion can flourish, when people are allowed to be compassionate, when people are allowed to come into contact with compassion. Um, Sometimes, in some places, people just don't have opportunities. Okay, okay. <coughs> oh.
people are comfortable with emotions. Maybe it's assumed to be a natural part of the process, but when there isn't that same comfortability with emotional expression, and there's almost a, a, this maybe misplaced idea about the role of emotion in, 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 in thinking and decision making, how do you resolve that with the uh, inherent emotionality of, of you know, expressing or acting compassionately? <clears throat> I'm aware of the English expression being emotional as having some connotation. Um, uh, but this day, you know, we are becoming more and more knowledgeable about emotion because a lot of research, uh, you know, is, is taking place all over the places. And um, if you look at the Harvard Business Review, <clears throat> the future is about getting to know people's uh, emotional pattern and, and in, in relation to their uh, um, uh, neural position, that is, you know, the, the, <clears throat> the function of the brain, so that we can maximize um, their contribution without them suffering without putting them, you know, under um, unnecessary pressure. <clears throat> so, one of the issues predicts about this as the future of, um, of HR, if you like. <clears throat> now, um, um, let's face the fact that we all have emotion and, and emotion plays a big part in our decision making why we like people that we like, why we don't like the people that we don't like. Emotion plays a big part. Why we choose a certain food, a certain color, a certain place to live. You know, these are all um, connected with emotion in one way or another. <clears throat> now, when we talk about emotion, uh, when we talk about compassion, we are actually talking about equipping ourselves how to manage difficult emotions. We are not talking about not having negative emotions. Compassion in the context of mindfulness is very pragmatic and it recognizes a different emotion, it, it recognizes um, uh, emotional expression. But one of the video clip, I think the last one, Jim Dewey, he says that we need to overlook, or we need to look beyond, not overlook, we need to look beyond the behavior, the emotional behavior of the person and connect with the deep-seated needs. So in the society, in the family, in the workplace, if we can do that, I think, most of the problem wouldn't escalate and, and the healing process would be a lot quicker. <clears throat> um, this book, The Emotional Life of Your Brain, talks about the type of emotion which is quick to recover. Quick to recover. The type of emotion which is very uh, slow to recover. It, it talks about five personality, emotional persona, uh, five personalities related to that emotion. You know, it's, it's, it's a good book. It's, it's, it's a while, about seven years of book that uh, I think is, uh, I, I still find it useful. Um, people who find it difficult to recover from, say, frustration. If you get frustrated, the first thing at work in the morning, and if that drags on the whole day, 
you're not going to be open to new experience during the day. It's from this book. Mindfulness, okay, we sit in meditation and we are curious about uh, what's happening to the pain, to the sensation, um, uh, to the body, to the mind. That means we are open to new experiences. But if we say the mind must be like this, it mustn't be like this. We are close. We are close. If we are close, if we experience something that we don't like during meditation, we find it difficult to recover. To recover. So, in the Mahasi tradition, whatever comes up, you okay, you observe, let go, you observe, let go, you observe, let go. In, um, in the expression of the scholar I mentioned earlier from Harvard Professor Ellen Langer, uh, she says, all you need to do is just to note, to notice, to notice new things. When you notice, okay, you discover new things. You discover new things. That's what massive meditation does. Just notice it. Notice it. When we notice it, we don't, we don't judge. We don't judge good or bad. If we judge good or bad, we actually close ourselves up. We're not open to other possibilities anymore. And the world is full of um, exciting things and, and experiences, and we can explore them. Do I answer your question? Okay, okay. Thank you. Protecting ourselves is the basic um, human instinct. We actually protect ourselves. Um, the problem with this protective mechanism is that, okay, we tend to see a non-threat as threat, non-threatening situation as, as a threatening. Um, as a result, we go unnecessarily into protective mode. Uh, <clears throat> if that happens, um, which book? One of these books that calls the Buddha, the second dot, the second arrow. The second arrow. The first arrow is not your fault. Somebody should at you. But not knowing how to how to deal with this, how to manage this. Uh, that's a word in in psychiatry is a rumination. We ruminate. We think about this again and again. We ruminate about this, meaning we shoot at ourselves again and again. So from the second dot, the second arrow, the third, the fourth, the fifth, it's all coming from inside. <clears throat> so forgiveness, um, if it happened between friends, for example, um, we have to be realistic, okay, um, uh, do we just save ourselves, or can we change the whole situation, we also, uh, we save the whole relationship, we save, we, uh, we, we, 
Uh, we look, we take care of the other person, the other party as well. We need to be realistic. So if our emotional level is not um, competent enough to look after both, okay, first we need to look after ourselves. So that we are not left with trauma. I want to use this word carefully, trauma. Uh, if you're interested in one book, um, uh, The Body Keeps the Score. The Body Keeps the Score. This is about how subconscious mind keeps shooting at it itself. Okay. Um, a Jewish person, okay, now we have just passed uh, Auschwitz. Um, memorial and anniversary. He, he was a survivor from Auschwitz as a child. And he came back to the Netherlands and then he, he had his son. His son wrote this one. So this person, he really hated uh, the Nazis and the way the Nazis behaved. But the way he behaved towards his son is exactly like the Nazis. I mean, subconscious mind. He was suffering and he didn't have, maybe he didn't get help to, the help he needed to recover from that trauma. So he behaved towards his son like the Nazis did to him. I would like to imagine that he was never able to forgive the Nazis. As a result, he passed those pain, those trauma, those scars onto his son. So we are talking about examining our own capacity in healing, whether we are able to heal just ourselves or whether we are able to heal both. In the last session today, I encourage you to be more ambitious <laughs> to heal everyone. <laughs> And I hope you become so. I hope you do so. <laughs> so in that sense, okay, compassion has everything. It has basic need like stress management. It has ethics. It has motivation for the greater good, not just for your own for the greater good. You are doing just your own business, but your intention for the greater good. If you are successful, many people will be successful. If many people are successful, the country will be successful. It's like that. Um, that's part of ethics. That's part of motivation. They are, they are linked. And if we are in that mindset, I believe that uh, starting from the workplace uh, to the family, maybe to the community, maybe to the uh, country at large. You know. uh, we, can, we can become part of conflict resolution in some way and not part of the problem. Because I, well, I emphasize this because you know, um, unconsciously or subconsciously, or not knowingly, um, we are part of the problem. I want to recognize this. I want to recognize it in, in myself and to recognize it in other people. We don't really need to blame anyone. By recognizing this uh, as the first noble truth, Dokka Tisa, by recognizing this pain, we can move on. We can move on. I think this is the time to stop, you think? So? Okay. So, um, today, uh, if you allow me to conclude, I um, present to you the, um, the merit of compassion, the, the, the vitality of compassion um, for daily life, for family life, uh, for social life, for business life, and for the life of, of, of a nation. 
I think uh, basically, you know, what I'm adding today, in addition to the previous presentation that you heard from me, is that we need to be interested in problem, in pain, in difficulties, to the extent that they motivate us and not bring us down. If we reach that level, you can be sure that our resilience is solid. With that resilience, with that resilience, um, everybody becomes powerful. With powerful citizen, with powerful heart, the country can only become powerful. Thank you. I have these books. I have these books. What's your name? Isabella. Do you want to help me distribute this to people? Thank you. To everyone who can read Burmese, okay? Take one yours if you know how to read.